We're a church on the move, always have been from the beginning. Um, if you are settling down to a complacent mode or um, comfortable, get ready for a thermonuclear blast. It's under your seat and it's time for us to move forward in faith, trusting Jesus for where he wants to lead us individually and corporately as, as a church. Um, last week I shared on Jesus' mission and ministry mandate for the Christian families, in fact, for all churches. And uh, we don't deviate from Jesus' great commandment and Jesus' great commission. Uh, they're the two great statements, one closing the Old Testament, one launching the New Testament. And so um, um, our ministry mission mandate flows out of this. And so what do we actually do? What have we been doing for 40, 46 years since we commenced in Mother's Day 1976? Well, five things I mentioned last week. Let me summarise them. We seek to wholeheartedly worship Jesus as a way of life. We seek to minister in Jesus' name by serving people's best interests. We seek to reach lost people with the good news about Jesus. Our mission offering today, I mean, what an amazing church the Bethel Centre Church is that we can partner with them. They support 50 people in the nations who are out there reaching people. And then we seek to enfold new believers into the loving fellowship of Jesus Church. When a person comes to Christ, they need family, they need community, they need friendship, they need fellowship. Um, I've only been in two churches all my life and like Tanya shared this morning, we so need the fellowship and the community of God's people meeting together. And the scripture says, do not forsake the, the assembling of yourselves together, coming together. So whether you're here or you're online, uh, watching um, is so important on a weekly basis to meet together with the people of God. Um, and then finally, we seek to help disciples become faithful, obedient followers of Jesus. And the end game of this is worshiping Jesus as a way of life, but then that we seek to be obedient to him. We seek to be faithful to him. Actually, it's all about him. It's all about Christ. It's not about us, but it's about him. But he connects us to our loving father. He fills us with the Holy Spirit. He gives us purpose and direction. So this is what we do. We've been doing this for, for 40, 46 years and, and we're not shifting from that. But how do we do it? Let me now share a little bit on, on some of the how-tos. Well, we have to place wheels onto this purposeful vision um, to ensure that we're always moving forward. You can have a beautiful car. You can have the best car. You can have a Formula One car. You can have a Rolls Royce and it can look terrific and be filled with petrol and diesel or whatever. But if you haven't got wheels on the thing, it ain't moving. It can look good, but you gotta have wheels and then when you turn the ignition on, it moves forward. And so uh, the church of Jesus Christ has got to be moving forward. And so we must put wheels onto our vision statement. So we turn vision into action by setting achievable faith goals. Now we put some together uh, for 2022, 2023. And we trust that we can achieve so many of these. But even if we don't achieve them all, I'd sooner set a target that's a little bit beyond my reach that requires me to believe and to trust and, uh, and for God to propel us. These are wheels to help us move forward. If you haven't received this, there's one I think the ushers will have for you if you wanna take it. And, and please, it's not just a piece of paper. I'd encourage you to pray over some of these faith goals. Help us as a senior leadership team you might come up with ideas. The Holy Spirit may give you an idea that is that we haven't thought of. This is the body of Christ. How do we outwork this? And we, we uh, want to move forward trusting him to see significant progress. Now, I wanna focus on the most important dimension of a church. That's a big statement. The most important dimension of a church that guarantees fruitfulness for generations. How can we guarantee fruitfulness for generations? So, so what's the engine room of a biblically healthy, stable and growing church? Good question. To me, the answer is 
being fully intentional and having a constant commitment to develop people, to develop new ministers, new leaders, new pastors, new missionaries, new church planters, uh, new, new leaders within our church, empowering, empowering our body here to truly function as, as the body of Christ. And so the Christian Family Centre relentlessly follows the pattern of the New Testament church, as we see in the 35 year history of the book of Acts. The book of Acts started Acts 30, the death resurrection of, of Jesus, the outpouring of the Spirit on the day of Pentecost, and Dr. Luke finishes it, we think around 64, 65 AD, when Paul is arrested and is on house arrest. Uh, we think, um, he died in 68 AD under Nero, Emperor Nero, who was just a, a Hitler personality, let me just say that, a nasty piece of works. And so finally they, the Romans bumped him off as well because he was such a bad man. But uh, the persecution in 68 AD, we know that Paul and a whole pile of Christians perished then. But the book of Acts finishes around 65 AD, Paul's in house arrest, they let him out, he goes to Crete, he goes to Spain, uh, some even think he may have even gone as far as, as the British Islands and uh, over a period of two or three years. There's just some, some kind of uh, um, evidence, not firm history. But we know he went to Crete, we know he, he was aspiring to go to Spain and then uh, re-arrested, put in the Mamertine prison and, and, and perished in Nero's persecution. So, but the book of Acts is 35 years. Christian Famison has been going 46 years. And so the book of Acts is a pattern book to help us understand. And God has given it to us for all churches like ours and all denominations to say, don't deviate from the pattern, stick with it. Don't move away from it. It's your true north, it's your guiding compass. If you stray from it and, and think I'm gonna come up with my own commission and I'm gonna come up with my own commandment, you're on your own. If it's not centered around Jesus, why would the Holy Spirit support us? Why do churches come and then disappear? because the Holy Spirit won't support a group of people that it's all about them and not about Jesus, or it's about uh, kind of deviating from the main purpose of what Jesus has given for the church. And so, so I wanna just uh, show you something in scripture that a lot of people actually don't see, and you may have seen it, because I've probably shared on it over the years, but um, most people don't see what I'm gonna share with you as they focus on the supernatural miraculous results of the book of Acts. I mean, it's the exciting part. Holy Spirit moving, people getting saved, bodies getting healed, demons being cast out. Okay, supernatural guidance, uh, people falling out of buildings and dying and being raised up again. You know, that's pretty exciting stuff. And um, so cripples walking you know, and, and exciting stuff that takes place. And so we, we tend to focus on that. The manifestations of the Holy Spirit as people go out, preaching Jesus and how they respond and, and we love that. <laughs> and I love it too. But I see so clearly some passages and they've impacted me deeply. And in fact, it's driven me over the years to emulate the example of the first church. And, and I see this fitting in with what is the engine room of a biblically healthy, stable, growing church? It's an intentional and constant commitment to develop new ministers and leaders. And we see this with the, the apostles. Initially, in Acts chapter one, there are 12. These are Jesus, Jesus people, okay? Then things start to happen. Uh, there's a move of God that takes place. 3,000 people get saved on the day of Pentecost. And then when the miracle of the man who was born lame, at the gate, beautiful, another 2,000 people get saved. So 5,000, it just says men. 5,000 men now were part of the church. I mean, if half of them were married, that's seven and a half thousand, and then they usually produce children. So let's say they have three kids. No, 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 no contraception in those days. They had, say, five kids each, average. Um, that's two and a half thousand married, and five, two, 12,000, 12,000 on to, hey, that's probably around, 20,000 people, that's a lot of people that all of a sudden this church, that there's no building that can, that, that can take them. So they meet in the temple courts. If you know the Old Testament temple, they had a huge open area where people could come in. 
and thousands of people could gather there. They met there for public worship and prayer and preaching. And then they realized this ain't church unless we're connected. They formed life groups or connect groups or small groups or house fellowship. They met in people's homes. And so that 20, they, they met. And so a church must grow larger and smaller at the same time. And, and it's very important because church is not just a big crowd, it's actually connecting people together to do life together, pray together, read the Bible together, share together, pray together, cry together, uh, hold each other up in times of suffering. And that can only be done in groups of, you know, I'd say between eight, 10, 12 people in, in small groups. And, and part of our, our goal is to double the number of our, of our small groups, we need that. And so this church is going great guns, but then there's a problem. Out of these thousands of people that get saved, at least half of them were Greeks. And the ones that were married, their wives caused a lot of trouble. That shouldn't surprise Greek people. Greek women are tough. And you don't wanna mess with them. Any Greek women here? Not gonna own up. Anyway, so what happened was that there's thousands of people and they can't go back to where they came from because they came from all over the world to worship. These are Jews who are Greek speaking Jews. We call them Hellenistic Jews. Okay, so they would come, a bit like Muslims go to Mecca once, once a year or they try to go once a lifetime. So for, in the Jewish faith, they would come to Jerusalem for the Passover feast where Jesus died and the day of Pentecost, the feast of weeks, celebration. So they get saved and then they're thinking, how do we go back? We're Jews, we belong to these synagogues, there's gonna be a lot of trouble. They got baptized in water, which is separation from the old. So they're figuring out how they're gonna go back, whether it's to Parthia, Armenia, Persia, Greece, Italy, Spain, they're everywhere. And so the, the, the leaders, the 12 apostles, they've gotta try and help these people. So there's a feeding program. Okay, feeding, clothing, housing. And the Greek women notice something, that the the women that were born in Judea were being favoured against the women and the men that were born outside of Judea. And they kicked up a stink. That's my interpretation. They kicked up trouble. And it says, and even you could see Peter and James John going, oh, yeah, yeah, we don't need this. We need this like a hole in the head. And, and he said, we can't, we, can't, we can't be bothered with all this stuff. These are really loving spiritual people. We can't be bothered with all this stuff. I'm just too busy praying. I'm too busy reading the Old Testament manuscripts. I'm coming up with messages. People are getting saved and, and, and I, I, I'm, I'm chasing, I'm going around in circles. I haven't got time for all this stuff. Do you know what they did? They said, you Greek speakers, Find out who are your natural leaders. Who are the people you have confidence in? Select them and bring them to us. You know what they did? They found seven, a team of seven. And these are all Greek men, Greek speaking men. And they bring them to the apostles. Let's read this, interesting. So the team of 12 becomes now a team of 19. Seven of them, and these, are, these guys are really talented. They're filled with the spirit. They're full of wisdom, full of faith. They've got to lead and administer the practical affairs of a church of around 20,000 people. You've got to be a high capacity person to do that. Like it's not just, it, these, these people were selected because they were the cream of the crop and God had called them and the people recognised it. And then it says here, let's just read the scripture. If I can find it, if I can find it. Acts 6, 3, so brothers, select seven men who are well respected, no, well respected, and are full of the spirit and wisdom. We will give them this responsibility. So you choose them carefully, select them carefully, present them to us, we'll pray over them and commission them. Then Acts 6, 5 to 7, it says, everyone liked this idea. That's a good one. Hey, we like this idea. And they chose the following, Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit, Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas and Nicholas of Antioch, an earlier convert to the Jewish faith, all Greek names. These seven were presented to the apostles who prayed for them as they laid their hands on them. Notice the result, guys. Expansion of the leadership base of the church, growth. The number of believers greatly increased in Jerusalem. The more competent and committed leaders that we have, 
and people released in ministry, that will cause growth. That will cause growth. I remember reading a book many years ago called The Pyramid Principle about leadership. I don't even think it was a Christian book. Might, might, have, been, might have been Christian, I don't know. And, and I forget everything else about the book except one thing. He said, how high do you want the pyramid to go? If you want a little pyramid, then you have a small base, a square. You want a big pyramid, you build a big base. And then it goes up. And the author, whoever he was, said, in any organisation, non-government, government, church, community, he goes, the effectiveness and the size and scope of that organisation is based on the leadership base that you have. The more leaders, the more trained people, the more people released in specific responsibilities, the higher, the more effective, the more potent that pyramid will become. Look, the other thing that happened in the book of Acts, and you, you'll see this pattern, is in Antioch. And so this is a church that was planted by the Jerusalem church. The Jerusalem church did a lot of outreach. And this is probably the most significant church. Now Antioch is just, just on the border of Turkey and Syria, along the Mediterranean coast. It's a major city, huge city, still there in, uh, in, on the coast there in Syria. It says in Acts 13, have a look at this, just, just it appears. Among the prophets and teachers of the church at Antioch of Syria were Barnabas, Simeon, called the black man, that's interesting. Called, why was he called the black? Because he's probably from Africa. And so that, they thought this is fantastic. We've got Africans now who, who are getting saved. Lucius from Cyrene, Manum, the childhood companion of King Herod Antipas, under King Herod's nose, one of his boyhood friends gets saved. And Saul. Notice that there were five new recognised leaders. So you've got the 12 in, in, in Jerusalem, the seven in Jerusalem, you now got five. And notice the focus, these guys, it says they were teachers and prophets, they weren't apostles. So the focus of their ministry was different to the 12 and the seven in Jerusalem. And, and it says here that, that Paul and Barnabas were recognised after much prayer, reflection and fasting. So out of these five, as they're worshipping, having a worship service like we had, they're praying, they're reaching out to God in adoration and worship and encouraging each other, Holy Spirit starts to speak. He says, I've got a plan for Paul and Barnabas. They don't even know what that plan is. I've got it. And people started speaking prophetically into their lives. And, uh, and after much prayer, they officially appointed them and commissioned them to become church planting missionaries. This is the first church planting missionary ministry that takes off. So then they go, Paul and Barnabas go, they come back after the first journey, took a couple of years, and they basically went from Antioch to Cyprus, which is nearby, and there's an amazing miracle there, what happened in Cyprus. And then from there, they get a boat and go to southern Turkey and they climb up the marshlands through to the plateau, which is called the Galatian Plateau. It's a huge area in central Turkey. And there they start to evangelise and plant churches. And so then they want to visit those churches again on the second missionary journey. And, uh, uh, but have a look at this in Acts 14, I love this. After preaching the good news in Derby, which is one of the places, Derby, Lystra, and making many disciples, Paul and Barnabas returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch of Pisidia. This is another Antioch. This is in central Turkey, where they strengthened the believers. They encouraged them to continue in the faith, reminding them that we must suffer many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. Life is tough. Sometimes life hands you a curved ball, and to be in the kingdom of God, the kingdom here on earth as God is building it, sometimes it's gonna to be tough, particularly when you have opposition. Paul and Barnabas also appointed elders in every church. With prayer and fasting, they turned the elders over to the care of the Lord in whom they put their trust. So, so what's the pattern? They preach the gospel first to the many, the hundreds, the thousands. Then they made disciples of many of those new converts. Say there's a hundred converts in a town. There might be say 50 of them that are really showing the signs that they're going on with God. 
Others may be they've made a commitment but they don't want to get baptised in water and they attend church once a month and, and you know, like, so Paul and, and Barnabas, they're making decisions. They're going, oh, they see those ones there. They come every week, they've been baptised in water, they give financially to mission. Oh, yeah, yeah, these ones. Let, let, let's make disciples of these ones. They preached the gospel first and made disciples of many of these new converts and then appointed a few of them as elders. Now, the term elder is a hopeless term because it gives a connotation, you've got to be an old man. It basically means, elder means leader. It means an overseer. The Greek word presbyteros means that you oversee. Episcopi means you oversee and you lead. And so you can be a young person and be an elder. And, uh, and so it, it's, it's to do with responsibility of caring and support and gifting. And so all these new churches were led by a team of leaders, not just one individual leader but a plurality of them. You see this there. Folks, it takes a team to oversee a church and to run all of the various ministries of a church. It always takes a team. If, if there's one person that is the, the leader of a ministry and everything revolves around that person, I don't think that's a good sign. That's not the New Testament pattern. There's gotta be a team. If there's a leader, there's gotta be a team. Leaders must work through teams. And, um, and you see this, this pattern here. Going on, as I lay this, this biblical foundation before I share a little bit on our, some of our faith goals. So Paul, in Acts 15, he goes to the Jerusalem church and, uh, and he has to report. Okay, that's like the headquarters. He reports. And so there's a big conference that takes place. There's a, there's a bit of division that takes place within the early church over the issue of circumcision. You know, should people who become Christians get circumcised? And some, some of the, the Jewish leaders were going, well, Jewish leaders who were converted, yeah, they should be circumcised. They should worship on a Saturday. And Paul says, no, 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 no. forget all that stuff. He goes, this is a new creation. He goes, you're not gonna win Greeks and Romans by saying you've got to be circumcised. Give me a break. Uh, he goes, you, you, the, the, the Christian faith would become a narrow little Jewish sect if you don't, if it's not internationalized. So Greeks, Romans, and Arabs, and all that. So Paul says, no, no, it's by grace, you, you get saved. It has nothing to do with cutting a piece of flesh or what day you worship. It's a new creation, it's new liberty. God now dwells with people, he lives within you. And you're saved by the grace of God through faith in Jesus. And so there's a huge conference, and over time, that, that you see here that the Jerusalem church appointed a group of elders as well. So Paul is appointing these leaders and these elders work closely with the 12 apostles. It says, then the apostles and the elders together with the whole church in Jerusalem chose delegates and they sent them to Antioch of Syria with Paul and Barnabas to report on this decision, decision regarding the entrance to the faith. This doesn't require circumcision or food laws or, or worship on a particular day. The men chosen were two of the church leaders, Judas called Barsabbas and Silas. So here we see the Jerusalem church, they develop a new team called elders, an eldership team. Not the seven, we don't know how many there are, but it's apostles and elders. And then they wanna select a couple of delegates. They find these two young guys, Barsabbas and Silas, who are obviously leaders in the church. They do the recognizing, they commission them to go to Antioch and report. So you see this whole leadership development, it's like a cauldron. It's, it's, it's like a hothouse that people are being recognised, people are being encouraged, people are being stirred, the Holy Spirit's moving on people's hearts, others are recognising it prophetically. And so there's this huge expansion that takes place. And then uh, fifthly, this is the, the final scripture, it's an amazing one really. So when Paul completes his third missionary journey, so you read the book of Acts, he finishes, he does three journeys, he goes back to Jerusalem to report again. But we see a dramatic change in the leadership of the Jerusalem church. Huge change. Acts 21, see if you can pick it. When we arrived, the brothers and sisters in Jerusalem welcomed us warmly. The next day, Paul went with us to meet with James and all the elders of the Jerusalem church were present. After greeting them, Paul gave a detailed account of the things God had accomplished among the Gentiles through his ministry. Who's this James? Is it James Zebedee, John's brother? No, 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 he was beheaded by Herod. Herod killed him, Acts 12. This vicious, demonic man killed James. He wanted to kill Peter as well. They, they obviously had killed Stephen. So it wasn't one of the 12. You know who it was? It was Jesus' little brother, the son of Mary and Joseph. Jesus had brothers and sisters, and this Jimmy boy 
was not really part of the group. He wasn't one of the 12. And in fact, he and his mum tried to do an intervention with Jesus when they thought he went too far in his preaching. You could read that in the gospel. So there's there's an argument to say that, that James wasn't really a follower of Christ initially. He was quite confused. But anyway, he ends up becoming the senior minister of the Jerusalem church. What? Why? Well, what we can see is that he's just such a wise head. Whenever he speaks, he's just wise. He's good and wise. You read his letter he wrote in the book of James, it's just so wise, practically wise. He had learnt of Jesus. And so you read the book of James, it's like reading the Sermon on the Mount, where he expands on, on the Sermon on the Mount. These 12 went. They went out. But there was a new leadership team that was in Jerusalem under James and a group called the Elders. Let's reflect on the significance of this pattern, this Acts pattern, as I share a little bit about our faith goals as a church and some of the CFC faith goals by the end of 2023. And I just wanna focus on this aspect, the leadership development side. We have said we wanna double the size of our teams for CFC congregations, our, our, our four congregations, our kids ministry, our youth ministry, young adults, breakout kids, creative ministries. Because if we expand the base of the pyramid, what's gonna happen? It's gonna get more stronger and more significant and larger and more effective. And and so um, here's a couple of questions that people raise with me from time to time about the church and how we're doing it. One of the questions that comes up quite a bit is actually why do we plant CFC daughter churches? Shouldn't we keep our pastors here? And you know, we love them and, and uh, you know, shouldn't we just keep them here and, and uh, you know, just sort of make sure that the Seton Church is, is, uh, has all these talented, gifted people staying here in one location? Good question. Uh, why do we plant daughter CFC churches? Well, we haven't got a choice. The scripture says we are to go and we are to evangelise and we're to win people to Christ and then to organise those people and fold them into communities and then find leaders to... to to oversee them, lead pastors and leadership teams. And so that's just a little bit. Let me just conclude by by saying, hey, look, we we are serious about engaging 50 young guns in leadership development by the end of 2023. If you're a young gun, now you might say, how old's a young gun? Well, I don't know, but we wanna actually develop a whole bunch of young leaders. And, And how do we do that? We wanna expand our training. So we've got some interns now. We'd love to see six interns next year. Some of you may be interns. It's not just young people, it can be older people, male, female. Our Bible formation course, we wanna see 30 doing it. Our leadership development course, 20 doing it. Our apologetics and culture course, 30. Life group leaders, we need to do, probably have 40 people trained. And for a church our size, across our congregations, we need to develop a stack of, of, of small life groups. Uh, we'd love to see four people go and serve in Darwin for a period of time. Might go for six months, go for 12 months and serve there. And uh, Kathy says she'll go back, even without me. We're talking to Alan Steele yesterday on the phone. I'm sitting in bed and, and um, well, last night, whenever it was, and, and he's, he's uh, talking to me, not to her. And she's starting to interfere. And I'm saying, just, just, he's talking to me. He's not even wants to ring you, ring you. And she says, Alan goes, well, I'm, I'm, I've got to be back in December, January, I need to find somebody. Kathy goes, I'll go. I'll go. What is that? She's possessed. Possessed by the Holy Spirit to go and serve. And I think, hey, some of you are like that. That you could go for three weeks. You could go for three months. You've got the liberty to go to places like Darwin or Alice Springs and serve our indigenous communities that are in such need. Um, And so uh, we want to expand our training. We want to plant a CFC church. We want to send a full-time missionary overseas. It's time to send another missionary to see them go. We've had missionaries going and now uh, uh, we're just keen to say, okay, let's let's trust the Lord that he's going to raise somebody up to to become a missionary. Let's stand together. I'd like to lead you in a prayer. And Musos, you guys come up and... uh, Because if I don't stop, I'll go for another, another hour on this. And I've only just touched the leadership development dimensions of our faith goals, which are really what underpins everything that we do. 
Let's pray together. Loving Father, we thank you for the clear pattern of the book of Acts. It's there. We can read it and not see it. We can reflect on the other more dynamic aspects of what took place in the book of Acts, but we see this underpinned everything. Their commitment to develop leaders, to identify them, new ministers, new missionaries, new church planters, and how the Holy Spirit worked through their prayers and faith and observation. They could see what, what you're doing in developing people. Lord, help us here at Seton to emulate this pattern. Help us to see that this is the engine room that guarantees our future fruitfulness and future growth. And Lord, I pray that out of this congregation, those who are here now, that you will be speaking to them about their future in ministry, their future in service. For some of them that are called to be pastors, some of them called to be church planters, some of them called to be missionaries, some of them called to, to lead significant departments in our church here. Others to, to go and support our existing churches like that group that went to La Fiva, a group of beautiful young adults with their families and helped transform that church from a much older church to a younger church with kids. I thank you for them and I thank you for what they're doing and under Pastor Jeremy's ministry, it's gonna grow and expand. So Lord, help us to see this and to outwork it and to see our faith get stimulated in a way that will cause us to take action. Lord, put some wheels in our life to move us forward. Help us not to be theorists about this, but to be practitioners. Help us to move forward. And I pray out of this group here that there are life group leaders to help care and enfold people into this corrugation. That there are new musicians, song leaders and worship leaders and musicians out of this group. I pray, speak to them that they've got gifts that they can be used by you. And may, may there, there be a, a great movement that takes place. We think of kids' workers. We think of our breakout ministry. Oh Lord, double the number of workers there. We think of our youth ministry. Double the number of workers there. People that will serve you. We think of, of Lord, all the, the areas of, of, of ministry and service that we're involved in. Touch people's hearts, Lord. Touch people's hearts. Help them to see that they are the answer. That you've brought them into this place, not to warm a seat, not to be comfortable, not to get into a complacent mode, but to be commissioned and to be committed to serve Jesus with all the gifts and talents that, that you have given to them. And I pray, move on people's hearts, Lord the Word that's been sown, as we see it from Acts and as we see where we're heading with some of our faith goals, I pray, release leaders, release new ministries and may the church grow in strength both now and in the coming days.